Okay, in the conclusion of this module, we're going to shift gears. We've mainly been talking, since we've distinguished between symbolic and material culture, we've mainly been talking about uh, symbolic culture and the attached meaning uh, given to abstract ideas. Uh, now we're going to conclude by talking again about material culture. Um, again, we define that as uh, things that have a substance, in other words, things you can touch. So many of the things we associate with material culture are things like clothing and jewelry, uh, weapons, um, you know, types of architecture, transportation. They're all pretty grounded in uh, understanding. We understand that uh, when different cultures wear different types of clothing or uh, jewelry or decorate their, uh, their hair or makeup or uh, other accoutrements that they put on, that those, we, we, we clearly see those and we, it's pretty easy for us to identify culture to culture uh, why different cultures are doing those things. So I'm not going to spend as much time on some of that stuff. Specifically at the end of this chapter I wanted to focus specifically on the idea of technology and its effects on uh, culture. Technology is defined as uh, a society's ability to create and use tools. Um, so sometimes we overgeneralize, especially in a technology-driven society like our own, to assume that technology only has to do with things like uh, computers and what we would call high-tech. But all the way through society, uh, technology has driven uh, changes in society. As we change and adapt and learn to do new things and invent new types of tools, uh, those changes in our material culture have really profound influences and effects on our symbolic culture as well. I usually give uh, two examples of this. One is a historical example and the other a modern example. The historical example I usually uh, uh, describe to people is for the vast majority of human history, as soon as we invented writing, a uh, written form of language, I usually say how did people uh, keep written logs and the answer overwhelmingly is we did it by hand. Uh, so from earliest uh, type of uh, hieroglyphics written on temple walls to what we call some of the earliest writing cuneiform which is usually styluses pressed into wet clay uh, and then we started to invent things like papyrus and paper later on vellum and other types of things but for the most part human written history was done by hand. So uh, I even talk about after the fall of the Roman Empire and what we sometimes call um, classical history, uh, before the Renaissance we talk about uh, this period known as the Dark Ages in which uh, there was you know, a carrying forward of a lot of uh, historical information, written records uh, that was mainly done, if you think about uh, medieval times, uh, monks sitting in monasteries. Uh, literally writing out longhand all the accumulated uh, information that had been collected throughout history. Um, and it was painstaking and very difficult and as a result uh, the written records, books for the most part, uh, were incredibly valuable, incredibly expensive, uh, owned for the most part by royalty and incredibly wealthy people uh, or churches, uh, in the case of uh, medieval Europe, mainly the Catholic Church. Uh, kept libraries and uh, perhaps other kings, monarchs kept libraries. But the idea that the average person living in those societies, the people on the lower end of the society, peasants, uh, even people who were considered wealthy to a large degree, middle class, uh, would probably have never seen, let alone owned, a book. Okay? So the information was uh, incredibly uh, limited and very many people did not have access to it until there was an invention. Okay? Uh, Samuel Gutenberg uh, invented uh, a printing press, an ability to mass copy or mass recreate books. Uh, and the very first book ever created was the uh, Bible. Uh, but quickly thereafter, this new invention was used to uh, take a lot of the written material that was available at the time and mass produce it. So within a relatively short period of time, libraries became accessible and universities uh, and then towns had libraries and then individuals were able to purchase and keep books in libraries uh, and knowledge became widespread leading to 
again, this what's li widely known as the Renaissance or the Age of Reason, in which human cultural uh, advancement took a huge leap forward based on a single type of technology that was being built or that was invented. Uh, so again, that's a very historical example. Uh, the modern example uh, clearly is uh, the internet. Uh, I use this example all the time and I use my crotchety old man voice. When I was a college student and I wanted to write a report, I had to get out of my bed and put on clothes and go to that big building with all the books in it and I would use a little card catalog to find the book and hope the book was there. Okay? Clearly, the, the uh, advent of the internet uh, has given us incredibly wider access to information, uh, made information much more widely available to us and in a much greater scope. And we can clearly look around and realize that the internet is having a very huge effect on our society. So in those ways, we can clearly see that new technology has effects. We'll go into this in a, in a future module. We talk about how societies have transformed over time, and we clearly know that mainly that was due to technological advances made by humans. Um, this leads to a couple of different things. Um, sometimes we refer to what happens when society's technology changes and its cultural or symbolic culture doesn't catch up. We sometimes refer to that as cultural lag. So sometimes society changes and then aspects of the society don't change along with it, leading to uh, sometimes some confusion. Um, so uh, attempts by individuals or society to kind of catch up to the technological advances being made. An example I often give here is by asking students, uh, you know, what semester we're in, and usually the answer is either either fall or spring semester. And I sometimes ask that anyone go to summer sessions. No, probably not. Very few do. Uh, when we look at our high school systems, we realize that students go to school from uh, September largely to June, and then they have three months off. And if you talk to educators and ask them about that idea of a three-month summer, uh, most disagree with it as far as at least uh, the effects it has on children. If you remember back to yourself, what did you do over the summer? You probably spent most of your time uh, having fun, getting into trouble, and forgetting most of what you learned the year before. When you went back to school in September, uh, you had to spend at least partial uh, amount of time uh, catching up and relearning a lot of the things you learned. And when we look at education systems around the world, we realize that students, for the most part, go to school year-round. Uh, lots of other places, you know, quad semesters, uh, but the education cycle in a lot of other places around the world is pretty continuous. That uh, students go to school year-round, with you know obviously breaks in between. Uh, but and then we realize, well, why do we have this system where we give students off? Well over well, approximately 150 to 200 years ago when America was largely an agricultural society and the majority of American families were farms and farming families and the majority of people in society were related in one way or another to agriculture. Why did children not go to school in the summertime? They were needed on farms. Okay? Uh, the family uh, needed the majority of people at home because, the, again, we'll talk about it and we have discuss this real briefly. The family was an economic unit and all the people were needed during the time that the farm the farm was the busiest. Well, we changed from being an agricultural society a long time ago. Uh, and when, when we talk about societal transformation, you'll see we've made several changes since then. And yet we still have this, what you might call, outdated or antiquated idea of when children should go to school. That's an example of cultural lag. Cultural leveling uh, refers to kind of the opposite, uh, that societies, especially around the world, when we look at things globally, are actually in some ways becoming much more like each other based on the spread of technology. So as technology spread around the world and societies are quick to kind of pick up on the, the new uh, technological advances, they also, with those technological advances, come new cultural ideas. We've definitely seen this throughout history uh, especially when you think about um, the idea of, <clears throat> uh, if you think about technological advances being different types of transportation, especially when we talk about ships. So as soon as cultures were able to interconnect with each other across oceans, then we also saw a lot of cultural ideas uh, for a very long time. Uh, we 
talked about what happened when um, Western society met Eastern society through trade routes and different types of technology. Lots of uh, 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 symbolic cultural changes and ideas being shared across those ideas. Nowadays, when we talk about technology spreading around the world, we're usually talking about it, once again, kind of occurring from the Western culture, or we can kind of be more specific and say the United States. As the United States culture, or as the United States technology spreads around the world, we see many parts of the world looking more and more and more like America, okay? American values, American ideals, and I follow those, um, those uh, cultural changes or those technological changes around the world. Uh, and we see uh, this kind of globalization of a lot of our ideas, such as things like uh, a capitalist system of economics, as well as kind of a lot of our culture being spread around the world uh, following uh, the technological advances. Okay? This concludes module three. Um, when, we when we convene again next week, uh, we'll start module four.